All right, welcome everybody. Appreciate you all coming. I picked a few abstracts you know, generating from a couple different topics. You know, sometimes there were multiple abstracts on one particular topic that sounded potentially uh, relevant. Um, the first topic that I kind of w was going to talk about, there are a couple abstracts from a couple different meetings on canine adrenal tumors. Um, and so, you know, with the widespread availability of abdominal ultrasound, um, we now are finding a lot more of the adrenal incidentalomas. You know, we, we see an enlarged adrenal gland and think, well, what do we need to do something about it? What can we do about it? Um, it's generally been agreed that an adrenalectomy is indicated when we have a functional tumor or when that tumor shows characteristics of malignancy. Um, and so some of these papers, some of these abstracts are kind of looking at, well, what if we just saw a tumor and took it out regardless. Um, so one abstract um, from the, uh, actually it was kind of a multi-institutional multi abstract, look at, looked at the outcome of dogs undergoing adrenalectomy for small adrenal gland tumors without gross vascular invasion. Of course one of the, and I'll get into a little bit about adrenal glands, one of the concerns we have in a lot of these is do they invade uh, the vena cava which can obviously make surgery a lot more challenging. Uh, hypothesis was that adrenalectomy would have a good short-term prognosis and one year survival rate would be high. So they had histologically confirmed small adrenal gland tumors that did not have vascular invasion. So these, they had 51 dogs in about a seven year span. These were adrenal tumors that had a maximum size of three centimeters, so not very big. Um, a lot of them, again, were kind of just incidental findings. Uh, they had CT scans to rule out that there was vascular invasion. So going in, they knew that these were going to be uncomplicated um, adrenal tumor removals, and they were all treated with adrenalectomy. 92.2% um, short-term survival, 83% um, one-year disease-free specific survival. Um, they had major complications in, in dogs, uh, sudden death and hemorrhage, which are kind of our standard concerns um, with adrenal surgery. Um, and so really the kind of take home is that we do these, we have these small uncomplicated adrenal masses and the, the risks associated with removing them is generally small. I will say a lot of these, when we talked about these in these abstracts were maybe they were in surgery for other reasons and they happened to find it. Um, some of them again were found on ultrasound and evaluated so you know it's still kind of the question of are we going in directly for these tumors that are small and not necessarily causing any clinical signs. Um, another abstract um, out of Australia looked at the short-term outcome of adrenalectomy for adrenal gland tumors in dogs without preoperative treatment. Um, and so now we're looking at dogs that have adrenal tumors and we're questioning whether or not they're functional. This first abstract really didn't look at kind of the functionality per se. They just kind of looked, said these were small masses, non-invasive surgery seems to be pretty straightforward. Their objective was to review medical records of dogs that underwent adrenalectomy um, for various reasons. Their goal was really not about what the mass was about, it was really more about their functionality and whether or not they received any preoperative treatment. So presumably these may have been functional tumors, um, cortisol uh, secreting tumors, pheochromocytomas, but they did not do preoperative treatment. Um, and so they're looking at how that might affect overall morbidity. So they had 54 dogs, 39 were adrenocortical tumors, 12 were pheochromocytomas, and three had bilateral tumors of different tumor types. Uh, 23 were less than two centimeters, 27 were two to five centimeters. So the majority of them were still on the smaller side. Um, they did not really go into a whole lot about, they did not have a consistent um, review of the preoperative evaluation as to whether or not they knew or did not know that they had uh, vascular invasion. So they found that four of them did have vena cava invasion. Um, and they had, and again, none of them got any pretreatment. 8% um, had major complications. Um, I think that's a typo of the, the 40. I think this is getting where into they were in for other reasons and had 
saw an adrenal mass and removed it. Um, seven did need a blood transfusion um, and 5% overall mortality rate. 11% minor complications. And basically they were looking at, again, all these different factors involving the, the mass, the tumor size, the type, which side it was on, whether there was intraoperative hypertension or tachycardia, whether they had to in, go into the vena cava, whether there were intraoperative or postoperative steroids, um, and really none of those factors affected the overall major morbidity associated with these. So the question really becomes, do we need to be treating some of these adrenal tumors? You know, typically we talk about adrenal uh, cortisol producing tumors. Do we need to pre-treat with um, trilosane if they're a functional tumor to get them to a um, normal level, um, heparin? Um, and so there are not really many proven, even in the human world, that some of these actually help the overall intraoperative morbidity. Um, even historically have used phenoxybenzamine for blood pressure issues and it just hasn't shown a benefit. And this paper kind of shows that pretreatment doesn't necessarily, um, or the lack of pretreatment doesn't worsen the morbidity. Now I will say, just to kind of bring it around to, you know, my experience, our experience here, um, you know, they're talking about a lot of times these little, you know, these, you know enlarged adrenal gland, but not necessarily big. Um, and in my experience, when I'm dealing with adrenal tumors surgically, this is typically what I'm looking at. So, you know, this is actually um, a right-sided tumor that's invading the cava, but this is a very large mass, and you can see the vascular adherence, if not invasion. Um, the, I actually recently did one that was on the left side, but it was intimately associated with the kidney um, and had to kind of remove the kidney off of it. So I think they're kind of advocating in these abstracts that maybe we can be doing surgery on these ones that we kind of deem incidental and may not worry about them clinically, which is fair enough, but do we still need to be doing that? Uh, or we're, do we need to be going in? And then in terms of kind of the preoperative treatment, you know, if I'm going in on something like this, I want to make sure that we're getting this patient as stable as possible. Um, and so um, the, the case in point, uh, the one that I had that had, um, uh, was attached to the kidney, um, that dog had actually presented for a, a hemoabdomen. Um, it was stabilized and it was actually did well, had a transfusion, but it was found that it had really significant hypertension. And so we actually did pre-treat that dog with amlodipine for a couple weeks before even considering going to surgery. And that dog did great preoperatively. His blood pressure responded nicely and he um, ended up uh, the hemoabdomen resolved, and he was just a much more stable surgical candidate. Surgery was still hairy, but you know he ended up doing really well. Kind of a you know for just general looking at adrenal tumors is first you know we want to make sure that it is a mass. Um, so again, a lot of times these are discovered incidentally. Um, typically, we consider it a mass if it's greater, um, the width of the adrenal gland is greater than one and a half centimeters. Um, we lose that typical kidney bean shape associated with that. And I will say intraoperatively for a lot of other surgeries, I see it all the time where like, oh yeah, the adrenal pole looks a little big, but you know, we don't necessarily do look at, go further beyond that because there are just other factors. Um, asymmetric in size and shape relative to contralateral gland. And so again, the adrenalectomy may not be indicated if the mass is benign, small, hormonally inactive, and non-invasive. CT is ideal to look for um, vascular invasion. But I think you know, the, the idea behind this is if we are in surgery for another reason, we find these little masses that are, are big or are, seem pretty benign but definitely abnormal, our morbidity in removing that may not be that significantly increased, and so if we want to do that, I suppose we could. I just still don't necessarily see that there's a reason to it. Functional adrenal tumor, again, we're looking to see, um, looking for cortisol secreting tumors, um, doing our low-dose dexamethasone suppression, uh, looking at pheochromocytomas, which are going to be signs associated with excessive catecholamines. I'm not going to go into all of 
you know, kind of the, the functionality of the adrenal gland outside of my area for sure. Um, but, you know, looking at cortical tumors versus medullary tumors, um, they look similar on ultrasound. So, you know, you're not going to look at the ultrasound and say, oh, this looks like a pheo, this looks like an adrenal cortical tumor. Um, but the question as to whether the clinical signs associated with it can lead you down the path as to whether it may be adrenal cortical um, or a pheo. And so historically, and again, this is where these abstracts kind of are trying to, you know, maybe question some of this. Historically, when we're dealing with a cortisol secreting tumor, we have a hyperadrenic cortical animal. Um, we look at historically looking at treating with trilostane for three to four weeks prior to try and get them to a stable state. Um, theoretically, this would mitigate any of the immunosuppressive effects, um, impaired wound healing, systemic hypertension, hypercoagulation, um, Addison's, pancreatitis, general associated with Cushing's, and then monitoring the blood work to ensure we're kind of leveling out. Is that really necessary? Not nece these abstracts say maybe not. We don't recommend steroids before surgery to try and avoid that rebound effect. Maybe intraoperatively with that uh, manipulation of the adrenal gland can be beneficial. Um, monitoring for hyponatremia and hypokalemia, um, looking for our mineralocorticoid decrease. And then with the FEO, again, historically we talked about phenoxybenzamine, and that really hasn't been shown to necessarily make a significant difference. They talk about um, ideally you're know, getting, dealing with them kind of at the time of surgery and postoperatively as well, getting dogs moving quickly to avoid venous stasis um, rather than using anticholactic anticoagulants, um, being ready to address the tachycardia, ventricular arrhythmias, and hypertension you may see at the time of surgery. The previously reported, if you look in the textbooks, the previously reported perioperative mortality of adrenal cortical surgery um, is about 13 to 60 percent for adrenal cortical tumors and 9 to 47 percent, so with pheochromocytomas. So these studies do have better outcomes. Abstract 1 showed basically 8 to 17 percent mortality. Abstract 2, about 5 percent mortality. My, my kind of bottom line is, yes, I think removal of these smaller kind of incidental anomas may not have as much of a risk than some of the bigger ones. Um, but one, do they really need to be removed if they're not causing a problem? We don't really have information about how those progress or how quickly they may progress to um, larger tumors. And I would advocate that though some pretreatment may not be absolutely necessary just kind of as a prophylactic um, measure, if you have a, a clinical issue, like in this case where we had the hypertension that was actually causing a bleed in the, in the hemoabdomen, um, you know, larger tumors definitely need more attention, um, more imaging beforehand. Um, and so even though those intraoperative risks may not change with pretreatment, some of those I think you're still getting a, a stable candidate is still really important. So that's kind of my two cents on the adrenal masses. Just, I don't know, you know, we see them not infrequently doing more ultrasounds. There's just more evaluation out there. So I just wanted to share that and see if, if you guys had any questions or comments about adrenal tumors in general. So in those cases where you find an incident, you have a dog that is Cushing's and you remove an adrenal tumor, do they have it in terms of resolving the Cushing's surgically rather than medically? Well, it kind of depends a, a little bit on, yeah, if, if that's the primary source of it, I think it can. You just have to watch for the, um, the rebound effects. And to be fair, I don't always do the very long-term analysis or management of these guys. And I, so the time frame that it would take to kind of resolve some of these, not 100%. But, I mean, the idea is that that would remove, resolve some of those signs. But we typically don't go in, again, it's usually more like these guys that are just causing an imminent issue with close to being vascular invasion, things like that, space occupying. I, I don't, we don't typically go in just because it's Cushing's. We typically do still resolve those medically. And that is something that, you know, these papers are looking at just kind of the, the surgical particular outcome. Um, you know, what the long-term medical effects on these smaller incidental anomas, I think, is still being looked at, like 
should we be taking these out surgically? I had a case quite a few years ago. It was a fairly young wire haired fox terrier that became cushionoid and was diagnosed and we were stabilizing it. And it, it was a show dog, so it was retired. And when we went in to spay it, we found an adrenal tumor, removed it, and it resolved mm -hmm. the disease. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it can. And, I, and that's, I mean, I guess ultimately, I mean, I, d I find myself in surgery a lot seeing the a little abnormal adrenal gland and I usually sometimes pause and say do I need to do anything about this majority of the time I say no I have sometimes even biopsied them you kind of shaved a little edge off if but only if there's an actual clinical indication I'd say the vast majority of times it's not documented that it's actually functional that the, this animal doesn't have a suspicion for Cushing's or anything like that this isn't really an abstract presentation this is a journal article, not a peer-reviewed journal article, but it's such a hot topic these days. Every week I get asked multiple times about CBD oil and how to use it. And up to, I mean, I really kind of, at this point, I just kind of cop out and say, I really don't know much about it. I, I can't really advocate it. I don't, I can't, we don't know much about it. And I still kind of say that, but there was a recent, we've actually been contacted by a representative from this company who is looking at you know, kind of trying to get more science out there behind it. And this actually, this pharmacokinetic safety and clinical efficacy, um, it's actually with a group at, um, I think it's Cornell, and they, um, they actually did present an abstract a couple years ago that this paper has kind of expanded upon. So they're, again, they're trying to get some more science out there. Um, and basically, this is a, their objective was to determine the basic pharmacokinetics um, and assess the safety and analgesic efficacy of cannabidiol or CBD based oil in dogs with osteoarthritis. And so um, this is you know, a paper put out, this is a, a company that's developed this product and they're basically trying to you know, get some science behind it to, to market it. But it was a placebo-controlled, double-blind crossover study. They had 11 client-owned dogs with had evidence of radiographic arthritis. They didn't really, I think it was any limb. It wasn't a particular one group of arthritis. Um, they gave them all uh, CBD oil at two mg per kg, BID. This is another, that, you know, people come to me, I'm, I have no idea really what dose we're even talking about. Um, two week washout between treatments. Um, they had all subjective veterinary assessment and client assessment um, owner questionnaires of lameness. They had weeks zero to four for each treatment and monitor the side effects and blood work. And so, you know, reminding that a double blind and crossover study, I mean, every dog got both treatments. So they, one dog got placebo, then it had a four week or two week washout period, and then it got the the CBD oil. So each dog was its own control basically. And the owners were blinded to what the dogs were receiving. They actually um, made it, it, had a, it was an olive oil based and so the placebo was like an olive oil and they put some essential oils to smell like so that it all looked and smelled the same. The CBD topic is it's very large so I tried to kind of pick out some things here and there. If anyone has additional insight, I'm, like I said, I'm curious. but. So the cannabis species contains at least 480 distinct compounds. And those compounds will vary between the subspecies of the plant, the part of the plant, how that plant is processed. We're mostly concerned about the phytocabinoids, which among those are the CBD and the THC. Those are kind of the two main things that everyone, of course, is concerned about. The CBD is found in both hemp and marijuana, but marijuana is the one that has the THC in higher concentrations. Hemp does have THC, but just in very, very small concentrations, which can vary depending on how things are processed, actually. Um, so that oil from hemp, um, anywhere from 40 to 99% purity of CBD, um, depending on the process where it's um, less than 0.3% of THC makes it legal. So it has to be less than 0.3%. Um, 
the why we worry about this, why why this is a thing at all. The endocannabinoid receptor system plays a role in pain modulation and attenuation of inflammation. Cannabinoid receptors, which dogs may actually be a little bit more sensitive, um, are present in the central and peripheral nervous system as well as the synovium. And so with these phytocannabinoids, there are a bunch of different compounds of those as well. Um, but they're structurally similar to eicosanoid arachidonic acid. Um, those are pre-inflammatory mediators. Um, cannabidiol was the first to be isolated, and then the THC, again, another. Um, there are a lot of companies distributing nutraceutical derivatives of industrial hemp. Um, and again, we just really don't know much about what we're giving them. Um, so in this study specifically, they use industrial hemp um, in, to extract CBD into an olive oil base at a 10 milligram per mil concentration. Again, less than 0.3% THC to be legal, so this had 0.24 mg per mil. Um, they actually, and when they did the kind of pharmacokinetic study before they did the clinical trial, they did looked at two milligram per kilogram and eight milligram per kilogram twice a day dosing in normal beagles. Um, again, they kind of did a crossover, um, and they found that basically the elimination half life and time to maximal concentration was similar. So then they just used the two mg per kg primarily for cost effectiveness. Um, they did not see any obvious psychoactive properties associated with either of these um, <laughs> uh, concentrations uh, um, over 24 hours. In dogs, so they, then when they went to the clinical trial, they established, okay, we're going to use two milligrams per kilogram BID. Now, they also did comment that the half-life is actually probably a little bit more frequent BID may, like they probably could give it more frequently to be effective, but they also were looking at client um, convenience. So that's why they picked the twice a day. Um, they had dogs with radiographic evidence of arthritis and signs of pain per the owner um, with detectable and painful joints on palpation. Again, they really didn't go into much detail about those. They did allow dogs to have NSAIDs in conjunction, fish oil and or glucosamine supplements. Um, but they had to have been on those at least a month before. They, they didn't want to change any of their medication regimen in this time frame, either a month before or during the study. The gabapentin and tramadol not allowed at least two weeks before enrollment in the study. Dogs were excluded if they had any pre-existing disease, renal, endocrine, neurologic, neoplastic, um, or were undergoing physical therapy, which I thought was kind of interesting. And again, this was randomized, placebo-controlled, <clears throat> so the owner and veterinarian were double-blinded, or were blinded to the um, treatment groups. And then each dog got two mgs per kg of the CBD oil or placebo twice a day for four weeks with a two-week washout period. They did, when some of the baselines, they actually did allow if dogs had a pre-existing elevation in mild elevation in liver enzymes, ALP, ALT, they were still allowed as long as they had a paddock ultrasound that said things looked good there. Ultimately, they had 22 dogs, which is not that huge amount, um, 16 completed the trial. Uh, they did the CBC chemistry and pain assessment by the DVM and the owner at weeks zero, two, and four. And they did find a significant decrease in pain and an increase in activity at the second week and the fourth week relative to the week zero based on owner assessment with the CBD versus the placebo. Um, they got some decrease in veterinary pain score, though it was not significant um, for the majority of the time. Maybe in the, for the week two, it was. It was. Um, the changes in CBC values, all ALP was significantly increased by week four. And that was increased above reference value, normal reference values. Creatinine did increase a little bit, but not above reference ranges. This was kind of a their blood work looking at, but just the one I'm focusing on is the alkaline phosphatase. So you can see this is the normal value, um, week zero. Um, this with the CBD oil, it increased. Now, granted, we got our plus or minuses, but again, they did find significant difference that this was a significant increase, whereas with the placebo there was not a significant increase. Um, this is their little whisper, uh, box and whisper plot. This, the box represents the mean of the 25th and 75th percentile, and then these are kind of the zero to 100, um, the 99th and first percentile. And so again, the, this indicates a significant increase from the baseline 
Remember, they did allow um, animals that had pre-existing liver enzyme elevation in the in the study. <clears throat> the study's conclusion was back to the pharmacokinetics that the terminal half-life was between four and five hours by availability with a schedule of two mg per kg twice a day. Um, it is a shorter half-life than is noted in previous studies. It probably could be more frequent dosing, but they chose the twice daily for practicality. The objective scores showed, those the owner scores showed that the CBD oil increased comfort and activity in the home environment. Um, the question was there a placebo effect? Each dog did serve as its own control. But interestingly enough, the 16, they had 16 dogs that treated, that finished the study. Nine of the 16 dogs' owners were actually in the veterinary field. I don't know if that skews things a little bit, if they were their own control, but it, it does, it, it's, an, it's a point that I took note of. Again, the veterinary assessments were favorable, but still not significant. Um, the kinetic, they did have, they mentioned that they had some kinetic data, which means force plate analysis, where they actually objectively measure a dog walking across a force plate and how much pressure he places, which theoretically is kind of the most objective measure of function and how you, know, you take a dog and if it's better, it has a better value, and that's an objective measure. Um, but they said that it was not presented because 11 of the dogs had bilateral disease, which make evaluation difficult, which is true if you have, you kind of need a little bit of a control, but it, it was interesting that they didn't even bother trying to present any of that data as to whether or not that could have, even if a trend was there. And then they commented on the increased ALP activity. Um, could it be the hemp e extract um, and cytochrome P450 liver metabolism, which has been reported um, previously? So it's not necessarily a new thing. Um, I think it's something that people don't necessarily think about, but um, the significance is unknown. The ALT did not increase, so <clears throat> not our, our damage enzyme. Um, but they did recommend monitoring the liver enzymes while on this the supplement. This was a proprietary strain used in this study. Um, so, of course, they're saying, you know, we've gone through all the you know, measures to, for safety and everything, and you, this doesn't account for all the other different products out there because they're all made differently. But <clears throat> they said, in general, these dogs were perceived to be more comfortable and active. There appeared to be no observed side effects. Um, the incidental rises in alkaline phosphatase could be related. Um, obviously, long-term studies needed, of course. Um, long-term effects, this you know, wasn't a very long study, um, but short-term effects appear to be positive. In general, my bottom line is, with this paper, it still doesn't give me concrete evidence that CBD oil makes a significant effect um, in pain from OA. Again, I get a lot of owners that have used it or are using it. I can't guide them in how to use it, but they some do a test that it makes them feel better. Um, I personally, you know, think the elevation of liver enzymes is not a small thing. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of medications that we use that can cause that, and it's not that we don't still use those medications; they can't still have benefit. But it is. I, I think we people tend to be a little cavalier about the CBD because it's natural, and et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I think it's still something I think warrants a close look in in its use. That is my two cents on the CBD oil. I didn't know if anyone had any questions. I probably wouldn't be able to answer, but or thoughts or or you know observations that they've had. If anyone's been using it or prescribing it, I guess I would. I don't want to say using it or maybe using it. I don't know. A lot of the owners that I talk to I'm sure, are also using it themselves, personally. So they use it and they feel it's beneficial, so they're also giving it to their dogs. There is, I think, a recently approved FDA product for human epilepsy. Um, and I know I talked with um, Dr. House, actually, our neurologist, bef before I came in. And she's, of course, she sees it probably more than I do on the, the neurologic side of things. And she does see a lot of dogs that are on it. And her impression is that it's not making a significant difference in these dogs' seizure thresholds. She said maybe there are a couple clients that feel that maybe they're having slightly less frequent seizures, but none of them are coming off their maintenance seizure medications to just be on CBD oil. Vascular ring anomalies in cats. Over my career, I really haven't seen many vascular ring anomalies in cats. There are very few reports in the textbook, so this is kind of a, you know, a little group study um, to kind of characterize what we see. 
in cats. They do exist and how they can do. Um, so this was a study out of Florida, um, A&M, again another multi-center study where they're kind of collecting cases and in eight years or 18 years they had 20 cases they could talk about. Um, the hypothesis was that as in dogs persistent right aortic arch would be the most common vascular ring anomaly and that surgical treatment um, would result in a good outcome. So again they had 20 cats uh, it's a multi-institutional re retrospective. 75% were less than a year of age. 90% um, presented with regurgitation, most common sign associated um, due to the focal megaesophagus. The 85% of those were diagnosed with a persistent right aortic arch. 20% of them did have a concurrent aberrant left sub subclavian artery um, as well. Um, and they actually overall did fairly well. 90% survived to discharge um, after surgery to release the PRAA. Um, there were 33% uh, complications, uh, 6 out of 18. Um, I think a lot of it ended up being the persistent regurgitation, um, but survival was overall very good. Follow-up, um, median of 275 days after surgery, so that was a pretty decent long-term follow-up. 69% um, did have persistent clinical signs, 31% had persistent megaesophagus, but despite that, um, owners surveyed, 62% uh, considered outcome good, 23% um, considered excellent. So overall, um, the 15% poor outcome, um, two of those were euthanized, one of those, sorry, was um, euthanized in three days, um, and the other one uh, actually had a balloon uh, dilation and actually his clinical signs or its clinical signs improved. Similar to dogs, just to kind of you know, kind of go through the numbers, 95% of dogs um, with vascular ring, ring anomalies have um, a PRAA, 95% of them. 33 had um, an aberrant uh, left subclavian. 92% survival to discharge. Again, we're talking about dogs. 18% um, died or euthanized within two months. Um, 87% um, were considered to have a good or excellent long-term outcome, and 70% had persistent clinical signs. Basically, the kind of take-home, young cat regurgitation, vascular ring anomaly certainly should be um, on the rule-out list. Uh, but overall, as with dogs, if we catch it and some of those um, esophageal dilation is early enough and can be reversed, then we can overall have a good prognosis, a, a good outcome um, with surgery. They do recommend, um, there was a recommendation, um, you know, how do we diagnose these? Obviously, you know, radiographically we can see, um, and, and it's certainly been advocated that if you see radiographically evidence of a uh, vascular ring anomaly, so you've got a focal dilation of the esophagus, just cranial to the heart base, so we know that there, or presume, that there is a uh, vascular ring anomaly, but there are several vascular ring anomalies. PRAA is definitely the most common, and certainly in cases, and I've seen it happen, if you want to, you know, money's an issue and they can't do a lot of workup, you can play the odds and approach it through um, the standard thoracotomy and look, but there's certainly the possibility that that may not be the actual answer. And so ideally, if you can, a CT scan, um, a contrast CT is going to be ideal to really evaluate the specific anomaly. A lot of these guys have concurrent, you know, the, the, a lot of these guys in this study had um, a barren left subclavia, which certainly can alter um, your surgical um, plan. There were a few different areas of discussion in different body systems about brachycephalic. Certainly I feel in my career over the last several years I, we see more and more of these guys. Obviously popularity is increasing, but I, anytime I see a breed in especially, an uh, increased amount of number of breed in especially hospital, you know, you got to wonder about kind of everything that goes into them, but well, they're out, uh, out that week. What? What movie's coming out? Right, right. Um, and of course they're friggin' cute, but they do get a lot of problems. So 
Um, one abstract looked at humeral condylar fractures um, in the puppy. So we do see a lot of elbow fractures, um, minimal trauma, jump the wrong way, epicondyle fractures, uh, condyle fractures in half. So um, this study, um, actually out of UK, looked at impact of breed on canine humeral condylar fracture configuration and outcome. Um, so their hypothesis was that Frenchies in particular may have an increased risk of humeral condylar fractures um, and are over-representative for specifically medial humeral epicondylar fractures, um, although surgical outcome should not be affected. So they had 112 dogs. Overall, they had 43,000 referral cases. And out of those cases, 112 of those were um, hemorrhagal fractures, um, and looking at kind of the breed arrangement relative to their overall general population, they did find that French bulldogs did have an increased incidence. 2.4% uh, of these were Frenchies. Spaniels, which we often think of as a high risk for these because they had the incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle, they were also increased, but not even as much as the Frenchies, at 0.9% versus all other breeds were 0.1%. Of the um, Frenchies, 22% of those um, had the medial humeral condyle fractured. Um, versus other breeds about four and a half percent. The general um, complication rate was 27 percent um, and I apologize I did not look at the, re the reported. Um, it's generally still pretty low. Um, the, they determined that epicondylar plate fixation, which is not something I'm typically doing on these fractures, um, did decrease the risk associated with the recovery. Um, they did follow up about six weeks after and noticed that the lameness was barely detectable. They did mention reduced range of motion. A lot of these guys, it seems, uh, you know, I think overall this is a relatively short follow up for um, range of motion at six weeks. Sometimes we can still see a little stiffness. Long term follow up in um, median of 36 months had excellent um, outcome in Frenchies, 87% um, excellent outcome. So they kind of proved their hypothesis that. In fact, Frenchies do have an increased risk of humeral condylar fractures. Specifically, um, they were 6.58% or times more likely to have a medial humeral condylar fracture than other breeds. But luckily, being a Frenchie did not affect the overall surgical outcome. So they get them more frequently, which I will definitely say I have appreciated um, over the last few years. It seems like almost every elbow fracture I've been doing in the last little bit has been a Frenchie. So I feel that is that kind of fits with what I have been seeing clinically for sure. And so this is really kind of the first, one of the first reports that Frenchies may be at a higher risk, kind of like the Spaniels. So it really isn't delving into yet why this may be. You know, do they have issues with incomplete ossification of the humeral condyle like the Spaniels do? Is there another reason? Um, but I did think it was interesting given that it kind of, like I said, reflects what I'm seeing clinically. I don't know if anyone else kind of appreciates that out there um, with the Frenchies. They, they tend to do well. We you know, typically repair them. I, you know, they talk about this epicondylar plate, and certainly if you have a more complex you know, TY fracture, you, know, you have to get more involved with that. But typically with these, um, kind of regardless of the condyle, um, the, the side, the laterality, um, we place a, a screw across the condyle and a K wire up the metaphysis to help prevent rotation. There's not a lot of room to do a ton of fixation there. Um, I used to worry a lot more about the growth plate than, than I do over the last years, but it, they do generally pretty well. The main goal is trying to get that compression as much as possible across the condyle, reopposing that articular surface um, and without a significant step defect, basically trying to get it as perfectly as possible, and they generally can do very well. All right, so moving on, continuing on the brachycephalic theme, some discussions about hiatal hernias, and really not hiatal hernias per se, like this obvious where we have the stomach, but more kind of a sliding 
subtle type of issue. Um, reminding that the, the gastroesophageal junction um, is not really a true sphincter. We talk about that as kind of lower esophageal sphincter. It's not a true sphincter. Um, it, ha it doesn't have much tone, but it works with the curl muscles of the diaphragm, which kind of create a little pinching effect to help create a sphincter-like mechanism that can help stop reflux. So, and these are out of Australia and the UK, so I had to use the their spelling for esophageal because they use some um, in abbreviations too to try and stick with it. But so esophageal hiatal malformation and dorsal herniorphy in brachycephalic dogs. It's an abstract from the Society of Veterinary Soft Tissue Surgery meeting out of Australia. Their objective was to describe the esophageal hiatal rim malformation identified in regurgitating brachycephalic dogs um, and report outcomes after dorsal hiatal herniorrhaphy. So they had 47 dogs um, that were presented for, for multiple reasons, but mostly in this case persistent regurgitation and these were dogs a lot of them had or were going to have concurrent airway surgery but simply based on the persistent regurgitation they actually were doing explorers on these dogs they weren't you know they didn't have that nice picture the x-ray I had where you see the obvious hiatal hernia they just said you know these guys are regurgitating we're gonna go in and look um, and they found that they t these 47 dogs had a substantial deviation of the pars lumbalis um, of the diaphragm I'll show you a, a diaphragm a diagram here in a second um, they did dorsal hiatal herniorrhaphy and esophagopexy in all of them and short-term follow-up in 14 days um, saw reduced regurgitation frequency in all but one dog um, and that dog had concurrent esophagitis which then resolved with medical management and one dog was euthanized but he had pre-existing aspiration pneumonia so it was kind of a poor candidate I guess to begin with. A lot of them had grade 2 to 3 laryngeal collapse um, so of course the concurrent respiratory issues. Long-term six-month follow-up uh, saw a resolution of regurgitation in 16 out of the 19 they were able to follow up with that's 84 um, percent res complete resolution. Three of the 19 the remainder had maybe once weekly regurgitation and we're not on any current meds so that's still compared to what they were presented with which was you know daily regurgitation episodes, this was a significant improvement. Interestingly, you know, we talk about hiatal hernias and how to address them, none of these dogs had a gastropexy. So that, you know, uh, hiatal hernia is one of the few recommendations to do a left-sided gastropexy. They did not do any gastropexy in these guys and they still got a really good um, resolution of signs. And so basically, just to kind of review, so esophageal hiatus here and so this dorsal pars lumbalis so this area here they said um, it was kind of interesting it was just very obvious you know normally this is kind of the width they could see it was just saggy in these dogs they could actually fit like three fingers through next to the esophagus in these dogs just as a as a course um, so what they were doing is they were pexying um, um, I think I might have gotten my things mix up. It, the mattress sutures basically above and below to kind of narrow that opening. Also um, esophagopexy. So if the esophagus is coming through here, they took kind of the wall of the esophagus and put little stay sutures between the muscle to do an esophagopexy, but did not do a dorsal um, or a gastropexy. And again, all those um, dogs showed significant um, improvements. Interestingly, um, I came across, not even really searching for it, looking for something else, but I came across um, an abstract that was presented at the European College of Veterinary Surgeons this year, um, which I did not attend, in Hungary, um, where there's a group out of UK, which is actually, the Animal Health Trust is actually like a, a charity group in the UK, and they do all these studies. I think in Europe, Frenchies, it's a, it's a big topic, even like, are we continuing to breed them, letting people breed them, things like that, but um, this group did CG comparison of esophageal hiatal size in small brachycephalic and non-brachycephalic dogs. Their objectives were to simply evaluate and compare the esophageal hiatus, OH instead of not EH in the study, um, in brachycephalics and non-brachycephalics using a CT scan. So they had 75 dogs um, that, between 2015 and 2018. They did um, a thoracic CT scan 
50 of them were brachycephalics, 25 of those had been referred to for airway syndrome, other 25 had been referred to non-airway related reasons, and then 25 kind of size matched brachycephalic, so they were less than 15 kgs, um, without any respiratory or GI signs. Um, they did CT scans, they measured the cross-section of that esophageal hiatus, um, as well as the cross-section of the aorta, and made a ratio between the aorta cross-section and the esophageal hiatus, and found that both Frenchie groups, or brachycephalic groups, it wasn't necessarily specifically Frenchies, but both brachycephalic groups had a significantly high increased esophageal hiatus, the 8.1, 8.0 versus the controls, which were 3.7. So those ratio values were significantly higher. So it, it's just interesting because that kind of just gives a little objective information to what the guys in Australia were seeing where they could see, look at this flabby esophageal hiatus and know that these guys really do have, seem to have this malformation. And so um, we know that in people, concurrent you know, reflex disease, sliding hiatal hernia are significantly correlated with larger esophageal hiatus. Um, we obviously see in a lot of these brachycephalic phallic breeds, this persistent regurgitation, you know, it kind of, one, supports this a specific anatomical factor. We often talk about the airway being a factor, and I'm, I can't say it's not, I'm sure it still is, maybe it's even a factor in how this develops, but knowing that there is supporting this existence of an anatomical factor that can lead to the predisposition of reflex disease um, in these breeds. Bottom line with the, the brachycephalic issue, brachycephalics extends beyond airway disease. Obviously that's a primary issue we see and perhaps probably you know, a lot of it's related. We get a lot of secondary changes certainly associated with it. They do have a higher risk for elbow fractures, though they tend to do well with surgery. Um, and you know, we often see the airway issues that often go along with GI issues. Um, so you know, additional tre treatment measures may be beneficial. I will say, you know, looking at this, I, you know, up to this point, it is not something I have really looked at from a surgical standpoint. I definitely, you know, we take all our brachycephalics. We ideally have them on, um, you know, um, a meprazole, something like that prior to coming in to do airway surgery because we know that so many of them have regurgitation. We see, you know, we have a specific anesthetic protocol for brachycephalic breeds that involves reglan to, you know, try and keep things moving. So you know, we're always very aware of this concern for regurgitation and so maybe we really, I guess I haven't seen a ton come back to me as a surgeon for this chronic reflux, um, chronic regurgitation, but that may be Maybe we should start considering that more. Maybe I should start seeing more of these. Maybe we really should be looking for these um, hiatal malformations that repair, that surgical approach is pretty straightforward, really. Um, generally pretty low morbidity, and so um, can it really make a difference in how these guys do just for the day-to-day, -day? and also as an adjunct to airway surgery. You know, if we're so concerned about these risks of aspiration, then maybe that is a way to help maybe ward that off. So the next few slides are really kind of one-off, you know, kind of individual abstracts, not necessarily going on with a bigger topic. Looking at anerotomy <coughs> versus resection and early nutrition, the benefits. <coughs> Comparison of anerotomy versus intestinal resection and anastomosis and early anaerobic nutrition on intestinal dehiscence and patient outcome. Um, this is a group out of Cornell. Their objectives were to quantify the risks of intestinal dehiscence following RNA versus anaerotomy and evaluate if early anaerobic nutrition had an association with improved outcome. Um, so they had 227 foreign body surgeries. 183 of those were in anerotomy um, and 44%, so kind of off-kilter numbers were RNA only. Um, and there was a higher incidence of dehiscence associated with the RNA, 18.2% um, versus 3.8%. Um, so their conclusion was that, you know, the statistics basically said that the RNA cases had a 5.59 times odds of developing 
dehiscence. Early enteral nutrition was associated with a shorter hospital duration, um, but significance was lost while controlling for surgical year, meaning this was, and I didn't get how long the time span, the exact dates were, but I think this spanned over several years where just general ways of practice had been changing. So the later cases were more aggressive with feeding versus the earlier cases, so it was harder to establish an actual significance associated with that. Um, of course, being a retrospective, which of course the majority of these are, makes it you know a big limitation. The, um, uh, an abstract from 200, 2017 looked at 243 cases. They had an overall risk, a 5% dehiscence rate, um, and 11% of those with an RNA versus the 18%. So dehiscence itself, if it does occur, resulted in a 30% mortality rate. It, it's just kind of food for thought. I mean, I think for, for both parts of it, the first part, you know, being the RNA, I mean, obviously, it, you have to do it, you have to do it. Um, we always prefer to do an enterotomy if we can, of course, but um, I think, you know, the, they, and they didn't really go into a whole lot of confounding factors, and again, that's where the retrospective becomes difficult. You know, the cases that needed RNAs probably had a lot more potential confounding issues that could also have affected the healing. Was it really just the RNA that caused you know, that increased rate or was it the other risk factors that necessitated the need for an RNA. If, it, if the gut works, use it. It's kind of as always you know, taught. I think if we can get these eyes, guys eating more quickly, I think that just helps overall with, it, with the healing process. Um, we use, um, obviously if they will eat, that's great, but we use a lot of NG tubes. And so certainly in some of these cases where I've been a little bit more aggressive, had to be a little more aggressive with a surgical approach like a resection, depending on the level of damage, I'm more apt to pre-place an NG tube while they're still under anesthesia. Um, if we don't need to use it, for nutrition, that's fine. It's still very beneficial in helping evacuate the stomach. You know, they're going to have some postoperative ileus. Um, it helps keep them comfortable, and I think just removing that fluid helps. But then also, if they don't feel like eating, um, then we can start nutrition pretty early as well and kind of stay ahead of the game. Um, so I think that is is important, and this study suggests that that early nutrition can decrease the overall hospital stay. In terms of the resection, I mean, it's not going to really alter my discussion with the owners. I'm not necessarily going to paint a much more grave picture. I always, you know, talk about a more complicated procedure if we have to do a resection, but it doesn't necessarily, in my mind, change the overall long-term prognosis. Splenectomy and arrhythmias. Uh, this was an abstract looking at the risk factors for perioperative ventricular arrhythmias and failure to survive to hospital discharge in dogs undergoing splenectomy, a group out of, out of Georgia. Their, their hypothesis was that dogs with anemia, thrombocytopenia, hemoperitoneum, or hemangiosarcoma would be at an increased risk for developing perioperative ventricular arrhythmias, and that the presence of those arrhythmias would increase the risk of in-hospital death. So they had 92 dogs undergoing a splenectomy. It was a retrospective, of as again, most of these are. Um, and 12, or 13%, had preoperative arrhythmias. 17% had intraoperative arrhythmias, and by far the majority had 43% had postoperative arrhythmias, which I would say is fairly typical. It seems fairly similar to what you know we see here. I don't have the obvious numbers, but it seems to ring true. They were unable to really address whether treatment occurred. You know, a lot of these we do end up kind of just sitting and watching and not necessarily treating. So as part of the retrospective nature, that kind of, they're now able to really identify that um, or really the severity of other issues that may have been concurrent. But looking at the different factors that they could evaluate, uh, lower platelet count, lower PCV, higher lactate, um, the presence of a hemoperitoneum and hemangiosarcoma all did, as they were hypothesizing, um, did were significantly associated with um, PVAs, or uh, the perioperative arrhythmias. But 88% um, of the, those dogs survived to discharge. So there were factors that did result in an increased risk of developing them, but the fact that they had them did not necessarily um, affect their overall outcome. So it did not really result in an increased 
um, risk of in-hospital death following the surgery. Again, they were not able to say whether or not these guys were treated, which um, for those arrhythmias. They did find one kind of as an aside, almost a lower heart rate at admission was a significant factor uh, for survival to discharge at the time of surgery, which kind of makes sense, but just kind of interesting. I mean, we do see a lot of these ventricular arrhythmias that we obviously always warn owners about and warn the fact that we might need to treat. Uh, but we typically, especially for splenectomies, especially as this study kind of showed, the majority of the time we're seeing them after the fact, not before. Often we're, we're watching them, and not necessarily treating them. Um, and I would say the majority of times I'm not treating them. I will say kind of as an aside, we have gotten um, kind of our you know, recent um, literature from the critical care group talking about um, GDVs and the benefits um, we have on those guys actually started pre-treating them with lidocaine um, before surgery whether or not we've seen VPCs so um, but that and that has seemed to I, I help I and mean, we don't I don't have the objective numbers but that that has been kind of come down from the critical care group that that, that makes a significant difference in reducing um, post-operative um, PCVs and or PVCs and survival any questions about that? How long do you guys keep EKGs going on these splenectomies and what's the easiest way to do it? I'm not finding very many machines that seem to be very friendly, cage friendly. We have, gosh, I'm going to forget all the little names of our machines. We have some that are cage side. We do actually also have a system and I think it's working occasionally where we have kind of a remote um, that it transmits to a screen. Um, I think honestly a lot of the times the issue becomes if they're too getting too active and keeping the, the probes on them. But to, to be frank, in my mind, if they're doing that well and that active, that's usually about the time I'm kind of saying I probably don't need to worry about it as much. I mean, I'll typically watch them, you know, for about 24 hours. And if they haven't had VPCs, then, you know, I'm very comfortable stopping it. If they have, it kind of depends a little bit. I still, you know, there's the ones that, you know, kind of throw the occasional, but have in 24 hours have never had any significant issues with big runs or hypotension or multi-form VPCs. And so on those guys, sometimes if they're otherwise, you know, bouncing around and eating and drinking and, you know, stable PCVs, you know, I, I kind of stop monitoring and get them home, basically. This is not something I deal with a ton, but the way I was trained is kind of different than what this abstract was suggesting. Um, so I was honestly kind of curious what you, you guys probably deal with these as much or if not more than I do, but um, elbow hygromas. Um, it's a fine specimen of a dog. So this was an abstract out of Greece. And so maybe the population is different over there. Basically, it was looking at Penrose drainage versus surgical excision, and they did 19 cases, retrospective study. And basically, their hypothesis was that surgical excision is more effective than Penrose drainage for management of hygromas. Um, I will say I've kind of taught not to really ever really mess with hygromas surgically. Um, but these, this group did. They had 19 dogs. Two of them had bilateral hygromas, um, mean diameter about 8 centimeters. Um, 11 of them they treated with Penrose drainage and 8 were treated surgically. 5 of the 11 had post-operative complications. 1 had some ulceration, 4 had recurrence, and these were the, the Penrose. The ones that had recurred they actually then went on and surgically excised. So now there were 12 hygromas that were surgically excised and they're conclusion was there were significantly less post-surgical complications and at a period of 17 months all were clinically healthy and did well. Personally I'm still nervous about trying to excise these. I you know dealt with the uh, dog legs and time even though as frustrating as it may be. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious actually if anyone out has any other thoughts or is more aggressive addressing these. Um, this, you know, abstract seems to suggest that surgery can still have a, a decent outcome, but with the absence of pictures, it's hard to know what that means.
two other abstracts I, I looked at. One um, involving the risks of complications associated with a maxillectomy or mandibulectomy. Um, we do a fair number of these um, for tumors and in general they, they can do well. But there's certainly a question, you know, there are variations on it, ones that may do better than others, and are there any factors? So they had 253 patients getting maxillectomy or mandibulectomy. 37.3% um, had complications. Of those, 62% were mild, only seven were catastrophic. They did find that dehiscence was associated more with a mandibulectomy, as well as the need for transfusion. Um, which would probably be indicating one of the catastrophic complications, um, is more often associated with a mandibulectomy being a larger mass or a more caudal resection. So in general, when we start getting back in that caudal area, um, it definitely becomes bigger blood vessels back there. It gets a little uh, riskier. So in general, you know, we do a lot of these and tend to do well and, and advocate for it as a surgical procedure. I will say a lot of, the, most of the time I'm talking with owners about the potential for dehiscence because I think it does happen not infrequently, maybe more than it's reported. But I would also say the majority of the time, if that occurs, it's typically managed very well non-surgically, you know, just allowing it to heal. Um, it's not common that we have to do a major revision or anything like that. The other um, point was all getting into, and this was interesting because it was kind of a, you know, at one of the meetings there was kind of a call, you know, the soft tissue veterinary surgery group, uh, it's kind of a smaller group and it, it's kind of neat, some of the meetings there that it's a lot more informal and so a lot more of a group um, collaborative feel about it and so they've actually now come together at a meeting, someone's posed a question, and following that, people kind of send in their information and they are able to kind of create a paper or get a little, do some retrospective studies out of this, so it's been kind of neat. Um, but, so this is one of those. They had five veterinary hospitals but for, te, for a span of 10 years, 2007 to 2017. So they had 863 dogs that um, had surgery for a gastrointestinal foreign body obstruction. They're still collaborating. They've, I think they've gotten a lot of data from this, and so they're still in the process of kind of collaborating at all. But one of the questions they were looking at is the difference between those that went to surgery right away on presentation or those that were hospitalized, resuscitated, um, and done surgery on kind of a more elective daytime type basis. And so they divided those that were taken to surgery more than six hours after presentation versus those that were less than six hours. And ultimately, they found um, overall similar outcomes. Now, arguably, they did show that those that waited did often need a little bit more, sometimes a more aggressive surgery, so like a resection versus just an enterotomy, and resulted in a longer stay. But for some reason, I'm not really sure kind of how that panned out, but that really didn't have an influence on the cost of the stay, or again, survival to discharge was still the same, similar between the groups. There was no significant difference between the groups. They still had yet, basically, they said the perioperative mortality with emergency surgery was 2% for those that went immediately to surgery and 1% in those that were delayed. Um, the immediate group also did eat faster, so kind of you know, back and forth um, between the two overall bottom line is they had similar outcomes long term. Um, they did not break down and I think that's that would be an interesting part um, whether these were simple foreign bodies versus linear foreign bodies. I mean certainly yes over the years I have gotten more comfortable with letting a simple foreign body that's you know an animal's pretty stable um, getting him fluid hydrated overnight and, and going to surgery the following morning and, and feel that we still have a good outcome. Um, linears, those are ones, you know, will come in in the middle of the night um, and, and cut. I, I think it's interesting that, that that information is kind of, you know, there's always going to be that it's retrospective and, you know, kind of some of the details may get a little um, cloudy, but um, just an interesting overall point. All right. Well, that is all I have. If you have any questions, I appreciate your, appreciate your attention tonight.